Distractions that we have going on right now. Not just um, not just here at the church, right? But distractions that are happening. Like the fact that my brother's calling me right now. <laughs> and he knows that I'm up here preaching, but he forgets. I love him anyway. He'll see the video later and be like, oh man, you called me out. Yeah, I did. I absolutely did. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Scott Tabor. I am the worship director here at Village Church. I get the pleasure today of being able to worship with you all from down there, which was amazing. Although, man, I wanted to grab this mic, turn it on, and start singing with them because, ooh, they sounded great today, didn't they? Like, just how powerful was that? That last song, Hosanna, it just, man, it gets my heart. Especially that line that says, break my heart for what breaks yours. And I think God's heart is breaking. Because there's so many people around the world that are just struggling and suffering. And uh, so let's pray. And then we'll get into the word today. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this amazing opportunity that you've given us to wake up this morning, Lord. To walk outside to take a deep breath of your beautiful weather and this amazing day that you've given us. Lord, I pray that you continue to bless all of us that are here, Lord, and those of us that can't make it. And just be with them. Keep them safe. Lord, be with the missions team, with the pastor and his wife as they're, man, they're just lifting up these little kiddos. And they're doing such great work, Lord. So I pray that you be with them and bring them home safely. Lord, we know that people don't make the church. You make the church. This is your place, Lord. We're just here. We just do what we know you want us to do. And we follow your word. Pray that you uh, bless me, Lord, that everything that I speak today is behind you. Lord, is, is through you that you give me the words. In your name we pray. Amen. So we started a series uh, last week. JM started a new series called Sorry Not Sorry. I love the title. It's kind of like clapping back at, at people that and things and, and issues in our society. And last week he spoke about words, right? About the words we say. I think it was titled Get Your Ship in Order, which is such a great title for a sermon, especially coming from him. It makes sense. And it's important for us to know, like the words that we say, the power that they carry, the strength that they have, right? Our words are like daggers. And the things that we can say can either harm or heal. And we can be very healing to one another or we can be very harmful to one another. And I think the biggest thing that he spoke about that really touched me as I was listening to the sermon, because my wife and I were out of town, was he spoke about gossip in the church especially in this place, not necessarily village, but just in church in general, amongst Christians, amongst, amongst all of us that are brothers and sisters of Christ. And maybe some of us aren't brothers and sisters of Christ yet, but we will be hopefully soon. And the talking behind each other's backs, you know, the, the whispers, the things that happen, it's scary and it's dangerous. And it can paint a really, really, really disgusting picture of what Christianity is supposed to look like, right? It paints a terrible picture. And so people look at that and they think hypocrite. How many of you heard the word hypocrite when it comes to Christianity? I'm gonna raise my hand because I've heard it a few times. So a little bit about me. I woke, uh, I, I woke up this morning and I had this, this thought process that, that was like, man, God seems to do this to me a lot when I go to preach here at the church where I'll have this great sermon written up and it's just amazing and I've been praying over it and all the verses are in line and everything works out and then I wake up and he's like, hey, maybe something different. <laughs> right? And so I sat and I prayed again and, and it was kind of like, it wasn't him telling me it was something different. I realized it was part of the distraction that's happening this morning. 
the fact that our screens aren't working, right? There's distractions going on in this world, especially here right now, right? He does not want us to get God's word out. And when I say he, you all know who I'm talking about. So I was born um, here in Miami, Florida. I was raised in the Catholic church, grew up Catholic all the way till I was 18. I left the Catholic church, went to a Presbyterian church. I actually fell out of church for a little bit. I stayed away from God for a bit. I didn't hide. I just wasn't in his presence in, in the way that I should have been, right? He was, let's say it like this, he was pursuing me, but I wasn't pursuing him, right? Like I turned myself away from the relationship with God and I was focusing on trying to find a religion that fit. So today's title of the sermon is Relationship versus Religion. And it's going to be a little tough and it's going to hurt. And some of you are going to hear this message and go, that doesn't make any sense. I don't think that's true. But everything I, everything I preach comes from the word of God. Everything I say is coming out of the Bible. It actually is kind of fitting that we don't have our screens up because I, I'm... I'm going to have to pull and read directly from the word of God. I actually stole one of the Bibles from the back. So when I'm done with it, if anybody in here doesn't have a Bible, this is yours. You can have it. Because I left my Bible at home. We also use, our church uses uh, uh, the Bible app. And inside the Bible app, you can actually connect to Village Church. And, um, and you can see everything that we've got going on in there. I actually don't really know that much of how it works. My wife reminded me at the beginning, hey, mention the Bible app. And I'm like, yeah, okay. I don't, I don't have any idea what it does, but let's go. Um, sounds amazing to me. Um, there's a quote that I absolutely love. Um, actually, before I get to that quote. So Presbyterian Church, Catholic Church, Presbyterian Church, Baptist Church, non-denominational church, or what they call Free Grace Church. And then my wife and I helped plant Village Church. And when I say help, I mean we met Brittany and J.M., which was a miracle because we weren't, it wasn't like we had called and said, hey, it's great to meet you. Let's, I was teaching at an FCA uh, training because I work for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And John Michael was there with Brittany. They were being trained because they were gonna help us out at uh, one of the high schools. They were gonna work with some of the athletes because JM wanted to insert himself into the community. And that's what we do here at Village, right? We insert ourselves into the community wherever we can possible. And so afterwards, him and I started talking because, I mean, if you, you everyone in here knows who John Michael is, right? You see him with his tattoos and his hair and his, his skinny jeans. You can't miss him with those sneakers. Sometimes they're purple, sometimes they're red, sometimes they're white. I don't ask him how much he spends on them because I'm not a sneaker guy, but I know that if they get scuffed up, he gets upset. Right? So it's, it's, I, I was instantly attracted and drawn to this guy. Just pulled right into his atmosphere. How many of you have ever felt pulled into somebody's atmosphere? Right? I was in his atmosphere. And so we started talking, and Brittany and JM, and they were so kind and loving. And the conversation was so amazing that I felt God was telling me, don't let this conversation end. This was happening in a parking lot in the middle of the summer, I believe, in Miami, Florida. So we were melting. And I said, well, I'm like, it was nice to meet you guys. And I got in my car, they got into their car and I pulled out and I think maybe it was a minute and a half, I called him. Cause I had gotten his number, I called him. And I said, I said, listen, I know this is awkward. <laughs> this is a little weird, I don't do this. <laughs> it's not me. But do you want to go to lunch? Let's go grab lunch, right? I didn't wait the I didn't wait the full day after getting his number, right? Like I know there's some rule. I didn't wait the full day, right? So I called him. I said, "Let's grab lunch." He said, "Man, yeah, let's do it." There was hesitation, and I found out later on he was hesitant because he's never done anything like that either, like a spontaneous meetup. It's just not something that either of you know. And so I called my wife because we were planning on going to lunch anyway. And I said, hey, I invited a couple people to lunch. I'll see you there in a few minutes. Okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> it, 
Yeah, and so she got to meet Brittany and JM. We started talking. At that time, I was actually working at this other church as a family pastor. And uh, one thing led to another. They told us about their, their vision of, of uh, Village Church and what God had painted for them. This absolutely gorgeous picture. And we just saw ourselves in that painting. We just knew it was right away. You know, sometimes you have to go back and pray about things. This time it was just like God was, man, he, he punched us in the face with a yes. So we jumped on board and did this. And now here I am. And it's amazing. And the growth of this church has been absolutely unreal. So all of that to say, I ended up here after going through so many different denominations and so many different religious rules that come with each denomination. Do we baptize babies or do we baptize adults? Do we do this or do we do that? Do we do this or do we do right? I, I went through all the different versions of it. Do we take communion every Sunday? Do we sit? Do we stand? Do we sing? Do we wear hats in church? Do we wear jeans? Do we wear baggy shirts? When we're praying, do we take our hat off? Right? Can I do this? Can I do that? All of these different rules were stacked up against me. And I sat and I looked at every single one of them and I struggled because I just couldn't find the place that I felt like God was trying to actually lead me. So back to the quote. Um, and I want you guys to think about this quote for a second. And the quote is, religion is a guy in church thinking about fishing. Relationship is a guy fishing thinking about God. Let's say that again. Religion is a guy in church thinking about fishing or football or baseball or whatever everyone thinks about right maybe not just guy i'm not trying to just anyone relationship is is doing those things while thinking about god because god is not just on sunday right jesus is not just a sunday thing we don't we don't take jesus off on monday and start our week we start our week with Jesus. We end our week with Jesus. Every day is with Jesus. Every minute, every breath, every second is with Jesus. Come on. So when we're sitting here in this place, yes, our thoughts might drift to other things, but we should be engulfed by Jesus. Amen. So the Amen. thoughts that we're having, even though they might be about fishing, it should be about fishing for men. That's right. Right? Because that's what we're called to do. That's why I love that quote. All right. Let's see if I can get this to work. All right. So we're going to read through the verses today. Um, and like I said, I know you guys don't have your Bibles. If you do have your Bibles, pull them up. If you have the Bible app, pull it up. Uh, we're going to go through Matthew, Matthew 15, 1 through 14. I know it's a lot. I'm going to read it, and I will do my best to read it as... I can't use that because it's dark up here. So let me use this. All right. Some Pharisees and teachers of religious law now arrived from Jerusalem to see Jesus. They asked him, why do your disciples disobey our age old tradition? For they ignore our tradition of ceremonial hand washing before they eat. Jesus replied, and why do you, by your traditions, violate direct commandments of God? For instance, God says, honor your father, father and mother. And anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father or mother must be put to death. But you say it is all right for people to say to their parents, sorry, I can't help you. For I vowed to give you to give God what I would have given to you. In this way, you say they don't need to honor their parents. And so you cancel the word of God for the sake of your own tradition. You hypocrites, and I love that line because it's in red, it's really big, it's got a, a exclamation point at the end of it. I should have actually screamed it, but I didn't prepare myself for it. I had planned, I was like in my head, I'm gonna yell it. But it, it, didn't, it didn't happen this time. You hypocrites, there we go, that's a little bit better. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. For he wrote, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas 
as commands from God. Now I'm going to stop there for a second, and then I'll, I'll keep reading the rest of the verse here in a minute. I'm going to stop there for a second, though, because there's two things that I want us to think about, two things that I want us to look at. Prior to this interaction with the Pharisees, n n not mere, like, weeks, but we're talking, like, within a day or two, Jesus had just performed the miracle of the loaves and fishes. That's why the Pharisees were concerned about, about, <laughs> about the, the disciples not washing their hands before they... Like you guys ate, you just fed a thousand something people with loaves and fishes. That was a miracle because you didn't have enough, but somehow there was enough. But we're not going to look at the miracle. We're going to be angry about the fact that they didn't wash their hands before they served the food. That's why he's screaming at them, you're hypocrites. You're looking at one thing while on this side God's doing amazing work, but you're looking at what you see as religious, what you see as tradition, and you're failing. You're preaching false words. How dare you? The second thing that I want us to recognize is the fact that when he speaks of Isaiah, the prophecy from the Old Testament... He gets it word for word. And let's remember that Jesus didn't say, hey, hold, hold on a second. Let me pull out my iPhone and get the Bible app and make sure that I'm getting my words right. My words. Let's focus on that. Because who gave Isaiah that prophecy? And who is Jesus? <laughs> so they're his words. So he was able to say them word for word to these, to these Pharisees because they are his words. How dare you? I was there. I heard Isaiah prophesy about you doing this very thing because I gave him the words to say that long ago that I knew I would stand here and repeat to you because you all study the Torah, because you are all part of the temple and it's what you have to do. Yet, you insert your own things into it. Was there a law that talked about washing? Yes, there was. But it has nothing to do with this. Because when Jesus came, that law was broken. That law is gone. No, no amount of washing your hands is going to get you to heaven. I'm sorry. We've all been washing our hands a lot for two years because of COVID. Right? So if that's the case, we're all going to heaven. Because we washed our hands a lot. At least I hope we did. Apparently none of us knew how to wash our hands before 2019. <laughs> Let me finish reading. Sorry. Then Jesus called to the crowd to come and hear. So after he's yelling at them, then he says, come, come around me. Come around me for a second. I need you all to hear this. Because... I, I don't want to just call them hypocrites where only they can hear it. I want to call them hypocrites where everyone can hear it. Because everyone needs to see that they are preaching false truth. So Jesus says, Then Jesus called to the crowd to come and hear. And he says, listen, he said, and try to understand. It's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. You are defiled by the words that come out of your mouth. Then the disciples came to him and asked, Do you realize you offended the Pharisees by what you just said? Like, hey, you, you, Jesus, like you get, like you get that you, like you messed them up, right? Like that, like that could be bad for us. You offended them pretty bad. As if Jesus didn't know what he was doing. It kind of tells us a little bit about his apostles and his disciples, right? They were really close to him, but a lot of them still didn't quite understand who he was. And that's actually a great picture for us because I think a lot of us feel like we're very close to Jesus, but we don't know who he is. We still don't understand, right? We can stand up here and we can listen to someone preach about eternal life, but we still don't get that that's amazing. And it should be shared. I'm not going to keep eternal life to myself. I want everyone to know about it. 
Then the disciples came to him and asked, Do you realize you offended the Pharisees by what you just said? Jesus replied, Every plant not planted by my heavenly Father will be uprooted, so ignore them. They are blind guides leading the blind. And if one blind person guides another, they will both fall into a ditch. The Pharisees were blind leading the blind. So if we, if we look at our first point, and I know we don't have the slides up, but if we did, it would be really cool looking because my wife worked on this thing flashy and awesome. No, it really, it really wasn't. It was just black and white with the names. And it, it's the, the first point, if you are taking notes, is uh, called Don't Fall for Fake. Don't Fall for Fake. Verses 1 through 9, Jesus is laying out for everyone to see what is fake. He's painting that picture for us to understand that sheep, like us, can be surrounded by wolves that look like sheep. Right? The Pharisees dressed really nice. They came from the temple. They, they had their tradition. They, they looked really great. Everything had to be very proper. And so if you were not able to approach them in the same manner, then you were not reverent to God. So the poor didn't really get a chance to be a part of anything they were doing. Jesus came to change that. Jesus was homeless. Jesus relied on his missions. Anywhere he went, he hoped that there were places. He didn't hope, he knew. He knew that there would be places that would open up and say, come stay with us. But he had no home of his own because his home was with his father in heaven. So looking at verses 1 through 9, out of frustration and exhaustion, Jesus clapped back at the Pharisees, right? Also to know, one of the reasons Jesus was so frustrated prior to this interaction was he had also just found out that John the Baptist was beheaded. That had just happened. And we all know what grief feels like. And so his frustrations built up. Jesus had human emotions. Because emotions are not sinful. What we do with our emotions can be, but the emotions are not actually sinful. I think sometimes as Christians, we have a hard time when it comes to understanding rules and traditions. Sometimes they appear at church, and whether or not they come from the word of God or from the word of man. I think sometimes we have a hard time understanding that. And I did. I had the hardest time understanding that. When I first started working here with JM at the church, um, leading worship, it was just me up here all by myself. We actually didn't have the stage. Everything was that way, so you all would be facing that way, and it was just me. We had a couple of lights and a board and a microphone and the track playing, and I would sing. And then Andy came along and made things much better. And I honestly didn't know how to place myself. I didn't know what to wear. I didn't know how to dress. Here was this guy with the tattoos and the hair and the hat, and the skinny jeans. And I just didn't know where I fit because again, my traditions were so mixed up. They were so blended from the Catholic church to the Presbyterian church to the Baptist church that I did not know which way to go. I struggled deeply with this. JM and I met and spoke quite often about my struggles. And then one day I came up here and I put my hat on and I led worship and Jesus didn't strike me down. <laughs> I didn't die. It wasn't the end of the world. There might have been some people who didn't like it, but is that my problem or theirs? Is that my heart or their heart? Is that something they need to work on or me? Right, because I'm already working on my own heart problems. And that's, that's what I wanna work with you all on today. It's what I wanna talk about today is that we have these heart problems that have us looking at other people and judging them by who they are, what they wear, what they do, and why on earth are they even here at church? 
dare you come into my place of worship looking like that? Really? How ashamed are we as a church that we struggle with that? And I think a lot of people do. A lot of churches struggle with that. A lot of churches struggle with how they, how they see others. I remember the first church that I ever went to um, that I saw a pastor wearing jeans. And I was like, man, is this, like, this is good, right? Like, we're okay. Like, he's got jeans on. Tony's wearing jeans. Like, this is okay. I, I was kind of like beside myself. I had just come from the Catholic church, which I don't know if any of you have ever been to a Catholic church or grew up in it, but it's slacks, dress shirt, tie if you can get away with it, like, you know, meaning like your mom can actually get you to wear it, right? And then certain, certain Sundays, it's full on suit. And there was no, no fighting that, no arguing that. That's how you had to dress to put your best foot forward for God. I remember hearing that quote so many times. Scott, you have to put your best foot forward for God. And by putting my best foot forward means I have to dress nicely for him. While we're driving in our car heading to the Catholic Church in our best dress, looking at homeless people on the side of the road that don't even know who he is. Amen. It destroyed me when I got older and started to recognize the fact that I had missed so many things that I had understood things wrong, that I was told things that weren't true because they were based off of man's law and not God's. Okay. Yeah. And I think the most amazing thing about God's law is how amazingly it changed when Christ came and died on the cross for our sins. Because that old covenant went away and the new covenant was made. We don't have to follow this long system of things to do to get to heaven. We get to heaven through Christ. That's it. That's it. That's the answer. Scott, how do you get to heaven? Relationship with Jesus. How do I have a relationship with Jesus? Let's talk about it. We can pray. Well, do I have to stop? Like, do I have to stop? Like, you know, I, I enjoy a drink every now and then. No, you don't have to stop doing that. Sorry, not sorry. You don't. Now, if the drinking is a problem... If you're excessively drinking, if it's causing an issue in your marriage or in other relationships, if it's causing you to struggle at work or school, if you're not even supposed to be drinking because of your age, then okay, let's have a conversation there. But that's not a Jesus, like that's not a, hey, you can't love Jesus or go to heaven thing. That's a sin thing that we need to work on because we're told Right? We're told to, uh, to love the sin, but not the sinner. Is that backwards? What's the saying? We are supposed to love the sinner, not the sin. So we lift them up. We work with them. We help them. We love them. We ask them to never come back to our church because they might smell funny. <laughs> Listen, these are all things that I've actually heard said before at churches. And it's so sad. And it's so hard. I believe these ideas and rules are pulled from the law of the Old Testament and their assumptions. And they're based off of traditions rather than scriptures. Like Jesus said, these Pharisees were using their own traditions, the things that they were taught. Right? So these Pharisees that came to Jesus at that time, we can't necessarily blame them as individuals. It's how they were taught. It's what they learned. Well, if you want to be a Pharisee, you have to follow these traditions, these laws. This is how it works. What do you guys think Jesus would have worn if he was here today up here preaching? What? Yeah, well... Yeah, that's what he wore when he was doing missions, right? When he was here on earth the first time. I don't know. I feel like I think he probably dressed about the same way we're all dressed. Because I think to be the hands and feet of Christ, right? To be the hands and feet of Jesus. To actually put our best foot forward for God. By being the hands and feet of God. Yeah. 
means that we place ourselves in a position to relate to those who we're trying to bring to Christ. Amen. Amen. That's right. So, so if I'm going to, listen, if I'm going to a really fancy affair where I know I'm going to have the opportunity to share the gospel, I'm probably going to dress up because they're not even going to give me the time of day if I'm dressed like this. That's just the society and the world we live in. I know there are people that have come to this church that have found out the things that we are so open to and have turned and left and never came back. That's a heart thing. It's not a church thing. That's not us. We're not going to change what we believe and love based off of the gospel and, and the word of God because they don't think it matches their tradition. So we place ourselves in a position to love and to worship and to, and to lift up God. And if we end up having to maybe change the way that we possibly dress to fit the scenario that we're in, there's nothing wrong with that. But if we're going to sit back and we're going to judge others for the way they're dressed, then we need to look in the mirror and figure out what's going on with our heart. I'm also a, a psychologist. Um, that's actually my full-time job. And I just recently started working at a elementary middle school um, doing school psychology, and I, I, I love it. Um, but one of the biggest things that I'm seeing in these middle school kids is these insecurities. They're insecurity. They're so worried about how everyone looks at them. And it's hard because it's not a Christian school. It's a, it's a charter school. So I really can't look at them and say, hey, let's get rid of the IN in front of insecurity. Let's remove it. Let's put it to the end. And let's have security in God. Amen. But I, I can't really share that with them. So there are ways that I talk with them to let them know that they, they need to find security in themselves. You are who you are. Yeah. Don't change for somebody else because that person themselves is struggling with an insecurity and struggling to make it through life. And they're putting their insecurities on you because they themselves aren't happy. And that's all part of this tradition. It's all part of these things that we need to break past, that we need to destroy. I really typed this thing way too small. Yeah, that's better. Religion teaches you that you have to do. Religion teaches you that you have to do. Christianity says that you can't do. You have to trust in the one who has done it for you. So whether it's Catholicism, Islam, etc., 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 every other religion in the world teaches a works-based salvation. Christianity is the only religion in the world where you are justified by grace through faith in Christ alone. Religion keeps you in change, but Christ has set us free. Amen. If grace costs us something, then it wouldn't be grace. If, if God came down and said, Scott, listen, you've filled my coffers only half. So I can't give you the same grace that I'm going to give your wife, who's filled it full. Oh, yeah, but we're to... Scott, you haven't done enough. You haven't worked on enough things yet. What? I built like four houses in high school. Does that count? <laughs> I, I, I fed the homeless. Does that work? I used to go down to the migrant camps and, and give out Christmas presents in Homestead. Does that, is that part of, yeah, Scott, but that's not everything. See, that's not how it works. Praise God Almighty. Thank the Lord that's not how it works. Or we would all be in so much trouble. Yeah. Grace does not work off of what we've given to get it. Grace works because it's just been given to us. For God so loved only the individuals who have done a certain amount of work to get to heaven. John 3.16, based off of Scott Tabor, who wrote it in his sermon, and it's not true. Who knows John 3.16? Go. What is it? For 
That's it. For God so loved the world. Not for God so loved those who can dress nice enough to come to my church. Not for God so loved the world for those who are sober, who are not using drugs, who have enough money, who can pay to sit in the best seats, who give enough money to park in the front row of the church. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. Tradition says that's not real. Tradition says, no, you come and you repent. We give you your repentance and then we'll let God know. No, what? How about I let God know that I send and I'll go to the person that I send against and I'll ask him for forgiveness as well. How about we do it that way? Because the Bible does say, you know, repent to one another, right? Share your sins to the person, right? So if I lied to you, I would expect that, that you would be open to hearing me ask for forgiveness because I'm going to go to God as well. And I'm going to talk to him about it. I've already been forgiven for any sin that I've committed. It's already done. So it's not like I'm asking God, Lord, take this sin, like just this one specifically today. I'm sure there'll be more tomorrow, but man, this one's pretty bad. Take this one, only this one. Don't, don't worry about yesterday because you, I already spoke to you about it. Well, I forgot to speak to you about it yesterday, but it's already gone, right? Just this sin specific. We've already been forgiven, right? It's why Christ died on the cross for us. The blood was spilled for us. It, 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 was, it was spilled all over that cross for us. It was as good as our blood. He washed us clean. Now, does that mean I can walk around and sin, 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 sin? No. It means that I need to work on a relationship with God. And when you're walking in a relationship with God, you are doing your best to live by the standards of what God looks for in a relationship. Putting him first in everything you do. So if you think about the things that you're about to do, if you go, man, am I putting God into this? And you're like, no, I don't want God to even know I'm doing this. Then you shouldn't do it. Yeah. It doesn't matter if it's religion or relationship. You shouldn't do it. Because if you're in a relationship with God and you're already questioning whether he'll like what you're about to do, the answer is no, he won't. Flat out. I'm married. I know. <laughs> the answer is no a lot. Or maybe, which means no. Trust me, I, I learned that lesson when I was like, hey, can I buy a Harley? And she was like, maybe. I still don't have it. So it means no. Y'all y'all see when you get married, those that aren't married, you'll see, you'll see. Maybe means no, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> Romans eleven six. and if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were grace, if it were, grace would no longer be grace. Romans 4, 4 through 5. Now to the one who works wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. It's all backed up by the Bible. I'm not up here making these things up. If I say grace is free, it's because God told me so. Point number two, are you offended yet? Have I offended anyone yet? Dang it. Are you sure no one's feeling offended? Man, I'm sorry, JM. I tried. I know. He's like, Scott, make sure you offend him. Sorry, not sorry. All right. I am running out of time, though. I got like a 45 minute sermon I have to write. Get down to like five minutes. So, when we're looking at the, the verse where Jesus says, Every plant not planted by my Heavenly Father will be uprooted. So ignore them. They are blind guides leading the blind. And if one blind person guides another, they will both fall into a ditch. I want you to change the word plant with the word doctrine. And I want you to think about that. Every doctrine not planted by my heavenly father will be uprooted. Every doctrine not written by my heavenly father will be destroyed. Okay. Did I change some of the words in the verse? Yes. Yes. But I only did that on the context of understanding, right? 
I, I, didn't, I didn't change what God said. I just made the context more visible or more understanding. If I was talking to a group of farmers, they would get it. So we change it up a little bit. Jesus replied, every doctrine not planted by my heavenly father will be uprooted. False doctrines and laws plague our churches. And like John Michael preached on last week, they're causing people to flee Christianity due to the hypocrisy that spews from the mouths of those who are supposed to be preaching straight from the living, breathing word of God. The living, breathing word of God. That's Hebrews 4.12 if anyone wants to look that up. Rumors and other forms of talk are destroying the church from the inside and causing those on the outside to want to stay there. I'm going to go ahead and close. I hate the aspect of religion that says you must do something to be right with God. I hate when someone tries to put legalistic rules upon believers. However, evidence of your faith in Christ is that your life will change. Evidence of your faith in Christ is that you will have new desires for Christ. Amen. Good. Amen. Say that again. Evidence of your faith in Christ is that you will have new desires for Christ and his word. I heard, I, I've, I've heard this so many times that Jesus hates religion, but that's not actually true. It's, it's not actually true at all. Jesus hates hypocrisy. Doesn't hate religion. False religion. He hates when people try to appear religious to show off. However, John 14, 23, Jesus says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. As believers, we obey not to maintain salvation. We obey out of love and gratitude. When you have true religion, you don't try to seem religious. You don't try to act like something you're not. You act as you are, which is a new creation in Christ. There's a huge foolish argument that's going around Christianity today that revolves around the way that we look at other people in all aspects of their life, their sexuality, their gender, who they spend time with, what they wear, what they're doing on Saturday nights. All of these things come into play when when and churches sit down to talk about what they want to do. The only thing they should be doing is opening their doors. Because every single person, regardless of their gender, regardless of their sexual orientation, regardless of who they spend time with, why they're spending time with them, how they act, how they're acting, what they're doing, regardless of all those things, the doors to the church should be open because they need to hear who Jesus is. Not because we're going to seek to change them, but we are going to seek to give them Jesus who will work in their lives to bring about the change that they need. It's not on me to go to somebody and say, you need to stop doing what you're doing and change. Who am I? I'm a sinner. I can't change somebody because I sin myself. That's God's job. What can I do? I can share everlasting life in relationship with God. Relationship with God. Walking hand in hand with the Father. Being his hands and feet when you go on mission trips. There was a, a story that John Michael posted Look at my time. There's a story that John Michael posted on our village uh, Instagram, and it showed him preaching. And he was preaching to a group of people. There were some kids, some adults. Um, and he was wearing short sandals. I think he had a jersey on, Miami Heat jersey. He loves that jersey. I don't, I don't know. But he had his sandals on. He had shorts on. I mean, you could just tell that he was in, he was in an environment where shorts and sandals and a shirt, it's all you need was sharing the gospel and he did that every night that he's been there he has preached every night that he's been there he has shared the gospel with children and adults every night that he's been there 
and not once do I think he pulled out his tight red jeans. We all seen the tight red jeans, right? I don't think he's I don't think he's pulled those out. I don't even think he packed them. Because God does not say, hey, John Michael, when you come here to preach as a missionary, I expect you to look a certain way. No, God says, I expect you to be in a relationship with me. So the way that you act is driven by our relationship. The way that we are with one another is driven by our relationship. Right? God says in the Bible that we are to love our neighbors, right, as we, as, as we ourselves wish to be loved. Why can't we do that for God? Why can't we expect to be giving him the love that he already reigns on us? That relationship needs to be worked on. It starts with the Bible. It starts with the word. That's why I love this church. Everything we do is based off of the, the gospel. It's based off of this Bible. We will not do anything if it's not from there. It's why we, it's why we have our backpack program. It's why we have our Wednesday night ministry. Right? We have the, the group that I should probably know the name of, but I can't remember. There you go, that. It's why we have a box in the back with little cards that says questions about the Bible, right? If you have questions about the Bible, write them down. And we're talking serious theological questions. If you are honestly going, I have no idea why or what this means, put it on that card, stick it in that box. We are at some point going to do a sermon series where we talk through those questions. Because it's an interactive thing being a Christian. It's not by myself. It's not just me. It's not just Scott. It's us as a village. And so it doesn't matter what you wear. It doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. I don't think I need to add anything to the end of that. It just doesn't matter. Dot, dot, dot. Just show up. Just show up. Be relational. Love on one another. Love shows up in the Bible so many places, but we can't seem to find it in church. Because we close our doors to the things that don't match what we're looking for. It's really, it's really disgusting, actually. Sorry, not sorry. But our doors will always remain open. Our empty chairs will always be filled with people who don't feel like they belong. Because they do. Here they belong. We all belong. That's what a relationship with Christ looks like. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this unbelievable beautiful day that you've given us. Lord, I pray that the words that, that, that you gave me to preach, Lord, were heard, they were absorbed, absorbed, that they were able to know exactly what it is that you're trying to teach them and bring into their lives, Lord. And for those that might not know you yet, for those that may not have that relationship, Lord, I pray that you pour your love on them Comfort their hearts, Lord. Fill them with this overwhelming feeling of joy and peace. Lord, and I pray that if they have questions, they come find us. There are people in the back who will pray with you. Come and talk to me. I'll be standing back there. Lord, for anyone in here that is ready, Lord, I pray that, that they lift up their voice to you now and they say, Jesus, I'm ready to have you be a part of my life ready to have you in my life so that we can commit to a relationship with one another so everything that I do is a part of, of you so that I am in the word and part of the word and I can become the hands and feet of you Lord I'm not going to ask any of you to raise your hands or stand up 
but I will ask if you if you spoke to Christ just now and, and you invited him to be in your life that you meet me in the back and let me pray with you and if you don't have a Bible we've got Bibles you can have my Bible wherever she just took it it's yours take it read it your name we pray, amen.